All right, we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. This is a uh, something of an emotional day for a lot of us because we're such big science fiction fans. Um, but what we're here to do today is to talk to Anne about her Imperial Rock books. And I know I'm not saying that the way that you would say that, Anne. How do you say it? I say Imperial Rutch, but it's okay because Rutch space is really big and there are a lot of different languages and accents and regional dialects, which means the way you say it is probably right somewhere. All right, that's perfect. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, so uh, let's see. This, this is a fantastic series of books and um, yeah, I love that. Totally love that because dialects are definitely a thing. Um, and Anne and I earlier were talking about how monoculture is something that we are really trying to uh, work against. <laughs> um, and so uh, one of the things that I love about these books is is all the different kinds of fascinating cultures that are non-uniform that you've put um, all over uh, Rod's space. And so... Um, can you tell us a little bit about designing this universe? Was it a very long process for you? It was long and uh, kind of piecemeal. Uh, I would just basically pull shiny things that I saw somewhere and think, oh, that was, it would be an interesting thing to put in. How would that fit? Uh, and then I would take the pieces that I had and I tried very consciously. As you said, monocultures are not a thing for very simplistic kind of stories or very simple kind of stories. They can be perfectly fine. But for my purposes, I felt like I don't think there are any real monocultures in the real world. We look around at cultures that aren't ours and we say, oh, they're all one thing, but we know our own culture is varied and full of contradictions and all kinds of little subgroups, but really every group is like that. So I kind of wanted to, to get that uh, sort of three-dimensionality onto the pages in my fictional cultures. So how long did you estimate, I mean, was this a project of like 20 years or, you know, was it five years or was it one year? Uh, it was it, around about 10, I'd say. Okay. At least, yeah, of building stuff up. And it was, it was in terrible shape at the very beginning. It was just sort of random stuff and it was flat and it was simplistic. And it took a lot of hard work in the last few years of that to get it into you know, decent shape. But, uh, but yeah, it was a long, long process. And so, um, how did you, how did you find Breck? Breck was actually one of the first pieces that I found and I don't know where she came from. Wow. Uh, one of the first things that was interesting to me was the idea of the character with multiple bodies and the character who had been previously part of a, of a starship. Uh, and, so I went forward with just those as shiny things to put in my box of stuff to play with, uh, and it became a very central part of the story going forward. I don't know where that came from. I don't know why those ideas popped up or fascinated me so much. Yeah, well, you know, the way that you executed it was really cool. Well, thank you. Well, you know, I mean, because talk about head hopping, right? This is, this is literal head hopping, but it's in a really interesting way. And so uh, I think it's, one of the things I find really interesting is that the way that you've managed it in such a way that it's relatively easy to keep track of what's happening in several different places at once via this via this overarching concept, right? So, um, yeah, that's quite an accomplishment already. <laughs> well, thank you. That was one of the most difficult things. I put off writing the novel for a long time because of that, because mm. I didn't know how I could do that. And in the end, I decided that the only thing to do was to do it in the simplest way possible, mm -hmm. the just clearest, just make it very clear and just put it in order on the page and hope that it was going to work, which it seems to have worked mostly. So yeah, I would say at this point, I think we can feel pretty confident that it worked. <laughs> um, so that's, that's cool. Okay. So um, while we're talking about Breck, um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, her emotions because, uh, whenever we've spoken, you've told me that she's a very emotional character, but I have actually seen people in review or in critique saying, well, you know, Breck is the soulless machine character. And it's like, well, 
no. <laughs> so uh, could you share your thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I, I have to admit, I'm a little surprised when I see those. Although, I mean, you're reading experiences, you're reading experience. And so right. if that's how you experience her, that's, you know, I have, how can I criticize that? Uh, that's, that's a real valid thing. Um, but I intended her to be a really deeply emotional character, uh, but one who was never going to knowingly show it. Uh, and uh, so in some ways that was kind of fun. Uh, she mostly, uh, I tried to depict her emotions by how the other people around her react and also by the reader becoming more accustomed to the very dry, understated way she says things so that at a certain point, you don't even need the other person there in the room to realize the implications yeah. of what she said. Uh, but that, it takes a while to sort of begin to teach the reader that that's how she operates. You're not gonna see that in the first chapter, right? Um, right. But it was kind of fun to try and figure out a way to get <laughs> these very intense emotions on the page without her ever saying, I am so angry, I am so heartbroken, I am. I love this person so much. I don't, she, I don't think she ever says any of that. Uh, no, indeed but I tried very much to imply it. And the risk of that is that some readers aren't gonna pick it up, which is fine. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully there was enough story, you know, to, to go along despite that. Uh, but that was what I was trying to do. Well, yeah, so, cause one of the things that I notice about uh, the ancillary characters in general is that they have this sort of rigid self-control um and and um also they have this sort of um superhuman competence right and when you combine self-control and superhuman competence it it really combines to create the effect of the sort of soulish machine which i think in in part is your point because a lot of people perceive them that way but they do perceive them that way and to some extent uh to some extent it may well be deliberate right because right. if you're gonna treat uh people the way these ancillaries are treated you can't think of them as human or potentially human and if they display right. emotions this is complicating all of that right then you feel right. sad for them um but also uh i was thinking of the ways that folks who are in a position who aren't in a position of power uh -huh. can't say directly what they're thinking or feeling because it's dangerous. Yeah. Uh, and so you develop ways of doing it that are uh, sort of coded and sort of secretive and sort of backhanded. Uh, you get kind of snarky in a way that's that so you can say something that's that's snarky, but then it's defensible because whatever you said was completely 100% innocent. I don't know why you would think I meant that right. because I only said, right? Um, and so I was also sort of trying to imitate that the way that when you're faced with somebody who has power over your life, you have to be super controlled about your reactions. Uh, but you also kind of want to be able to say things. And the only ways that you can say things are sort of understated and sort of sideways. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. While you're writing, Juliet, can I say something or would you yeah, rather so write? Go something? for it, Kat. I thank you for um thank you for validating my fan theory because one of the things I'd said to a friend when I introduced them to this book is that it was the most accurate portrayal in English I'd seen of the culture that I was raised into, which is that very Japanese uh you don't say things outright. Things can be implied, things get said in the interstices between the words you didn't use. Um, and so Breck's um, expression was, it, it felt very um, real and also very plausible and, and comfortable actually in, in an odd way. And um, the phrase that hasn't been brought up yet that I like to use is emotional continence. Um, because it's about learning to control the when it's emitted and when it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's a thing that um, modern American life does not prize as much as it used to. And emotional continence is often seen as being, um, well, to be vulgar, um, anal retentive. 
Mm. Well, I would argue that so, uh, in in American culture, we say that what we want is that free expression of emotion because how right. could you trammel up your emotions? But in fact, uh, only the powerful and the privileged are yes. able to do that. If you are not powerful, your expression of those emotions can get you, sh you know, well, shot yes. literally, uh, but also, yes. you know, you can get squished. So it's, that's one of those really interesting uh, paradoxes, right? Our society says right. one thing, oh, we should all be free and honest, but actually not everybody gets to be, right? Yeah, but right. thank you. That's a, that's a really, that's a good point. <clears throat> yeah, yeah it, it showed marginalization really effectively. Well, and I think, um, yeah, I think there's some, you know, because because there are so many different groups involved in these social situations. I think one of the things that's going on that's really, really interesting is that relative to a lot of people, Breck is super, super powerful. And yet she's completely under the orders of other people. And so she's in this really interesting sort of sandwiched position where she's, she's controlled and used. And at the same time, she has control over other people. So it, it allows for a lot of uh, interesting explorations. Yeah, thank you. I kind of did that on purpose once I realized what the character was that I was thinking. Uh, it's because to me, it was more interesting to say, look, you can do both. You can be oppressed and be an oppressor. Uh, right. And some of that is, I mean, you know, I'm in a social position where I have my one single marginalization. I'm a woman, woo. But all these other things, I'm in a different position. I'm not being oppressed from all these other angles. And so that's a thing that, uh, that I've sort of tried to look at in my own life and that I found interesting to talk about in a story. Now, obviously my position is not like Brex, right? Uh, but uh, that's something that I think is worth exploring and thinking about because I think a lot of folks are in that situation where, you know, nobody's only on one dimension all the time, right? Right. Okay, so I wanted to ask you, um, since we're still talking about Breck, I, I asked uh, earlier, and I'm going to have you just tell us about this again, because um, it needs to be on the show part of the of the of the afternoon. Um, how you worked on Breck's voice and and <laughs> character voices in the story. <laughs> Usually I have something very articulate to say about how I wrote, but when, uh, when it comes to character voices, and characters do have very distinct voices, and it's important to, to be able to put them on the page, but all I can tell you is that I, ha I see the character, and then when I start writing, I try and hear them when I'm writing their their words right and I can't that's not going to be helpful to anybody um but I feel like I need to reach for a feeling that I've got some kind of sense of how they would sound if they were actually speaking uh and I don't know that's got to be some kind of uh a bunch of subconscious things put together and a lot of writing work is subconscious uh but I'm sorry that I don't have a better way to describe it <laughs> well you know I mean but I do think that there is some value in in saying, you know, maybe all that you need to do is kind of s to focus on being quiet and listening for a character, right? Mm -hmm. um, to try to, you know, everybody's got a different technique, right? <laughs> right, right. So, you know, just because you're going on your gut doesn't mean it might not work for someone. So, so I figured we should, uh, should, we should mention that, yeah. have that on the record, right? <laughs> <laughs> At what point... At what point in the in the process of creating this universe did you decide on the details about uh, the lack of gendered pronouns in the Rodic language and uh, and at what point did you decide to use she for all of the pronouns? So I actually decided that relatively late in the process. Uh, I had written a first novel, which no one here is going to read. It's really dreadful. It's in a box. Um, it was it was my first NaNoWriMo novel, in fact. Uh, it's really bad. And uh, I had assigned binary genders to the characters in that novel. It was not ancillary justice. It was kind of around the edges of ancillary justice. And uh, was really unhappy with the result because it wasn't 
getting what I wanted, which was the feel of a society that truly genuinely just didn't care about gender at all. Right. It just wasn't, you know. Um, and so uh, I sort of toyed with this and tried to think how I was going to deal with it. Uh, at some point, I tried writing a short story using all masculine pronouns. It was a really not a good result. I didn't like it at all. Uh, and it took me a while longer to finally say, well, what if I used she? And I resisted it for a while because I thought it'll sound funny. Mm -hmm. Which the more I thought about that, the more I thought that was really just wrong. <laughs> that I shouldn't let that stop me. Um, and I said, you know, if I try it, uh, the worst thing that can happen is I won't like it and I can delete it, right? That's the nice yeah. thing about writing. You can do anything you want and you will not even come away with a bruise, right? Well, maybe your fingers will hurt, you know. Um, <laughs> you, won't, you won't actually injure yourself if you write a thing and it didn't work. You just delete it or you put it in your saving right. scraps folder. You know, don't delete stuff, put it in a folder somewhere. Um, and uh, so I tried it and the more that I tried it, the more that I liked it. Uh, I was considering what today is. I had not, when I made that decision, yet read The Left Hand of Darkness. It's a sad day today. Um, but I knew about the choice that Le Guin had made in that book, and I knew how she had talked about it later on uh, and written rewritten part of it or written a short story, changing it to feminine pronouns. Uh, and so that was part of my thinking. I said, well, let me try it. Right. Uh, and then I was partway through the draft and then I read The Left Hand of Darkness and I thought, oh, I should have read this a long time ago because it's awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, so but it was relatively late in the process. But I had been struggling for a while before that to solve that particular problem, which obviously is not a problem that I am the first person to be confronted with in science right. fiction. Uh, quite a few folks have have uh, wanted to to do something with that. All right. Okay, so so I'm I'm sure that you've been asked about this just a ton, um, but I'm going to ask you about it again. So so I I understand that there was a moment where you had to fight for she, kind of, uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. Can you tell us about that? Um. So what had happened was I expected that nobody was ever going to buy the book. I expected it was unsellable. Uh. But the thing is, when you're a writer, you send stuff out. That's just you send stuff out. It, rejecting it is not your job, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I said, right, I'm going to do it to the best I can. I'm going to send it out to agents. So uh, I got uh, an agent asked me for chapters and then asked me for the whole thing and then sent back a note saying uh, that he wasn't too sure about the pronoun thing. And I almost panicked because the other thing about being a writer is you desperately want to be published. Mm -hmm, and yeah. Of course, in science fiction and fantasy, at any rate, you if you want to be published by the big publishers, you need an agent, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I thought this might be, I might be totally uh, losing my chance at representation if I say, no, I want to stick with the pronouns. Yeah. And so I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I said, no, actually, before I sent this out, I told myself the pronouns were a deal breaker. So I sat down and I wrote this agent, this like 5,000 word long email explaining why I had to keep the pronouns. Mm -hmm. And then I sit there and wait by my inbox, you know, clicking refresh. And the answer comes back, okay. <laughs> and that was, that was, that's my agent for some obvious reasons. He's now my <laughs> agent. Um, and, uh, one of the things, it surprised me that it was so easy, but I was so terrified. That part wasn't easy. Um, and so then it went out on submission and the editor who acquired it said, okay, he wants to buy it. Uh, he no longer works for Orbit, uh, but he was great. Uh, he, but there was, he felt there were some bobbles in at least the first chapter that wasn't quite working, but he was good with, you know, I said, I'm, I'm married to the pronoun thing. I'm not going to change that. And he knew that. And then when he came back with edits, he was like, yeah, I thought we had to do something to the first chapter to make this work better. But then I realized, no, it's fine. So that 
that really surprised me. It surprised me a lot because I expected to have to fight harder. Uh, but in fact, I did not have to fight anywhere near as hard as I thought I did. So I, I do like to tell people that story, not to like, oh, my agent was so, you know, hung up. He wasn't. Uh, but to let people know that when there's a thing that you really believe in in your work, that it's okay to stand up and fight for it, even though it's yeah. super scary. You're so afraid that you're going to ruin your career or never be published or whatever if you put your foot down and say, no, I've got to keep that. No, that's really important to me. And I can't guarantee that every time somebody fights for it, they'll get good results, but right. it's worth it. And you never know. Uh, sometimes we imagine more resistance than maybe there is. Uh, sometimes we don't. Uh, and I can't make that call in every case, but I do think it's worth knowing that sometimes it works out okay and that it's all right to stand up for the stuff that you believe should be in your work. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, um, that's really interesting. So, so, okay. So, um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, um, a lot of, a lot of your writing decisions seem to be very, very conscious. Um, and, and so uh, the, the idea that, I mean, so there are a bunch of different skin colors that show up at different points in the stories. Um, and there's some characters that really stand out. Um, and, I, and I wanted to ask you, um, were those things that you had built in from the beginning? And, and what was your process in making those kinds of decisions in terms of you know, character skin colors and and appearances of various types. The question of skin color was one that I did make very consciously and very early on because it was difficult for me not to perceive a lot of far future space opera that I had read as being exceedingly white. Mm -hmm. uh, and really a future with no black people in it? Really? Yeah. That just really? I couldn't see it. And I said, well, so there's so much of the one, I may as well just go completely the other way. I'm gonna make, instead of the beautiful ivory skinned person who's beautiful because they're ivory skinned, I'm gonna make the beautiful dark skinned person who the darker skin is more prestigious. That's kind of a simplistic and naive way to go about it, but what the heck, uh, I did that on purpose. Uh, similarly, and I know we were talking about her before, uh, mm -hmm. station administrator Kellar, uh, uh, who is, quite large. She's fat. And she's considered the hottest thing going on the station. She is <laughs> yeah, just gorgeous. About her. And, and that was very much on purpose because uh, another thing that I had been thinking of, about, and I don't think I dealt with this as much as I could have throughout the trilogy, but there I did it on purpose, was how very much uh, standards of beauty don't, are, they aren't, uh, you know, people talk about it like, oh, this is biologically ordained. <sighs> Maybe, but they're also very cultural. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason why, in fact, there have been earth cultures that consider someone who is, who has a lot of fat on their body because they're well-fed and healthy and uh, to be extremely attractive. Uh, and why wouldn't uh, one of my far future societies have that? I'll put that in, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, it really has tickled me how many people just love that character. Uh, I really because I'm very fond of her too. <laughs> well, how could you not be? She's yeah. so incredibly attractive. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> how did you choose tea? Oh, uh, because I like tea. Okay. Right? Uh, right. And also for two reasons, I love tea. And also I'm a huge fan of CJ Cherry's Foreigner books. And tea is a tremendous, uh, tremendously important thing in those books. Mm. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, it's a, a sort of a hat tip to her. Uh, and also I love tea. And by the time I got to the second book and realized that I was going to really go into tea, then it was a really good excuse to do a lot of research. Yeah. Right. And buy lots and lots of different kinds of tea. <laughs> and uh, I'm still working through the backlog from that research session. That was. <laughs> well, uh, so tell us about your research into tea and how it was useful to writing book two. Oh, well, you know, there are lots of awesome kinds of tea. Uh, 
of course, part of the book takes place in a, a tea, at a tea plantation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I did do some research on growing it. But also I said, well, I have to decide what kind of tea it is. And so I drank all these different kinds of tea and then settled on a kind. Uh, and that was just kind of fun. Uh, but it also, I find kind of like hearing a character's voice when you have a really good sort of sensory feel for the thing you're writing about, mm. uh, it gets down on the page better. Uh, when you have seen a thing in a museum or in a house or whatever, when you've seen actual clothes and the way they move on someone's body, uh, when you've seen these things or felt a particular kind of fabric, I think there's something that happens in the way that you describe it that just becomes more vivid and concrete. Uh, and so the all the drinking of the tea did help me with that i think uh, to the extent that i have yet to go on a to an event or on a tour and not have somebody bring me some tea oh, that's which wonderful. is awesome and sometimes they'll apologize they'll say i'm so sorry i don't know if this is the kind of tea you like but it's my favorite tea and i always say no i've had the kind of tea i like i would like <laughs> to try your favorite tea right and so that's kind of super awesome <laughs> that is super awesome. Um, while we're on, while we're on, okay, so, gosh, so it seems like I, I have two things in my brain. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 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 One is, <clears throat> one is that I thought it was really interesting that you chose the tea plantation scenario to look uh, I guess concentrate and localize the conflicts in book two because in one of the things that tends to happen is as stakes escalate in a trilogy they'll kind of come unmoored from the characters a little bit and the and and what's actually going on on the page and so it'll start feeling a little bit more distant and that and one of the things I really like about uh, Solary Sword is that it still remains a very close and intimate feeling book, even though those larger stakes are not lost. So, yeah. Yeah, and some of it, uh, I think one of the things that happens, especially with trilogies, is that you feel like you have to up the stakes from the first book. And so if the stakes were already really big for the first book, what are you gonna do for the second book? And I think that's where things just become kind of unmoored, as you say. Uh, and so you, I so felt like- Changing the, the stakes, right? Right, yeah. Um, and I felt like I didn't want to do that because the stakes aren't going to get much higher than they already are by the end of Ancillary Justice. Right. It's the same stakes. Uh, it's just still playing out other things. And uh, I kind of like that more personal level. So uh, I actually spent some time with uh, books like uh, Patrick O'Brien, which are uh, continuing naval adventures right mm -hmm. uh and noticing that there's still those books are fabulous there's a lot of uh very personal lots of waiting for one thing there's a lot of we have this big battle and now we're going to wait for an entire novel for the next battle to happen <laughs> uh and uh and it was still really working for me uh and there's a lot of personal stuff playing out but it's playing out against the background of this huge war right and i felt like that was going to be a better model for what i wanted to do going forward Cool. Um, so now I'm going to go back to the other thought that I had, which was about the dishes. Ah, because um, dishes are just such a big deal. <laughs> and and actually, um, you and I have spoken before about how much I like how much I like five. Um, who is in charge of the dishes? Isn't that her name? Yeah, it's color five. Yeah, color five. There we go. <laughs> She's she's wonderful and um and she's really a minor character but the fact that she just loves these dishes so much makes her so memorable. Um does this stuff does stuff like that kind of happen by accident as you're writing along? Oh, absolutely. Uh Color 5 I knew was going to be there. Uh but in the first chapter of Sword I needed something I needed some business for her to perform. I needed some props for her to hold. And, uh, and some reason for her to go from one place to another. Uh, it wasn't plot important, so I hadn't 
planned it out at the beginning. Uh, and I just said, well, okay, teacups. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, she was a connoisseur of teacups because it just felt like it that little moment where Breck looks over, basically over her shoulder, looks through her implants and sees what she's doing and says, oh, I see what she's doing. And it sort of connected to her character. And then that just kind of, once that was there, then I can't just leave it lie. I'm pulling that forward through the whole second book. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it became a really important, because of course the moment where she brings out the actual good dishes becomes a really big thing. And mm -hmm. uh, and I just kind of did that as I went along. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was an accident, but it was fabulous. It was marvelous. Uh, and she's another character who it really tickles me when I see people talk about how much they love her and how much they identify with how much she loves the dishes. <laughs> And that was totally because an there accident. Are, there are a lot of people out there who really love dishes. <laughs> <laughs> My mom is one of them. She just loves dishes. It's great. Well, pretty um, dishes are pretty, right? I mean, they're really neat. Dishes are delightful. <laughs> and, and you know, in, and in some ways, I'm going to ask Kat if she has thoughts, because a lot, <laughs> in some ways, the, the attitude towards the dishes really reminded me of Japanese attitude towards dishes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was about to interject with what everybody doesn't like dishes, but um, <laughs> I know that's not universally true, and I think it's tragic. Um, yes, I love the dishes bits. I, I love the small details, and I, I know you're going to get to the gloves soon, but the tea and the dishes was another thing that I just went, oh, oh, look, we're out in space. We don't have to have coffee. It's not space coffee. Right? Tea, that was the other reason I did tea. It makes so much more sense. It's coffee always coffee in space, isn't it? And, and, coffee and, yeah. is so Eurocentric, even though it's a global drink, but it's just, there's so much processing behind it and all this other stuff. And I'm like, look, there's a plant. We start getting hot well, and hot liquid. It's tasty. Let's go. <laughs> Yay. And now we're going to think about what kind of lovely cup it's in. And so, yes, it is a detail I love. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I have some dishes. I'm going to tell you briefly about my dishes. This won't take long. Um, there are these beautiful bowls. They're from Japan. And some friends of ours came over and told us, you know, because I think it was Christmas time when we had them over, took my husband aside and said to him, you know, these are autumn bowls. And, and we were like, oh, okay, all right, sorry about that. Now we know. And so now when they come over, we don't bring out those bowls unless it's autumn. <laughs> but, but for ourselves, we like the bowls too much to only use them during the autumn. <laughs> I think the, pro the real problem is that we don't have spring bowls, right? Or uh, summer bowls. We really need to have well, a larger collection of dishes. <laughs> I, I need to explain that my pantry is entirely inadequate for my purposes in my apartment, even though I have an eat-in kitchen because... I have an inadequate amount of, of, of dishware for my cultural background. Okay. But, um, <laughs> by Western standards, apparently I have too many or something or people, I, I don't know what's going on. But um, yeah, I, Marianne Mohanraj actually has four seasons worth of, of dishes in her lovely giant well-apportioned kitchen. And it makes me feel very at home because... This is the culture I got raised in. Now, clearly, I'm sure there are people in Japan who do not have four seasons of bowls. And in fact, my mother gave up on that when I was in my childhood at some point because we're in California with earthquakes. I don't know how her mother in Tokyo with earthquakes was managing it. But yes, how can you, how, how can you put the food in the wrong season bowls? That's just... And, 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 and then the food clashes, and I don't understand why you have to have this matchy matchy floral china with a gold rim and and then you put all of your food on it and you don't really worry about the interaction of the colors of your food with your plate then that disturbs me and so when I am taking pictures from my food blogging I'm like oh this little light colored food I'm going to use a dark bowl or a dark plate oh this is a a dark colored thing I'm going to put it on a nice contrasting white thing and and this makes sense and look somebody wrote about it <laughs> <laughs> Color five would have a lot to talk about. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, so since we were on, since, let's let's do the gloves, Dali. Okay. So tell us about when the gloves came into your concept. 
the gloves came in really, really early. And once again, I have no idea where they came from. None whatsoever. I had to retcon a reason for it because I was like, the gloves are cool. All right. Now I have to understand why they do the gloves because there's got to be, a, you know, and I mean, it would, isn't necessarily a reason that makes sense. I mean, why do we all wear pants and not all wear skirts, right? We used to all wear skirts until, you know, uh, for cultural, we hit various, various different cultures who wore pants. Uh, and I, I don't know. They're cool. Uh, I know what my retconned reason is. I'm sure the it's got to be more complex because most reasons even in the real world are more complex than my retconned reason. I, cool. Julia, well, I mean, I, I, but what I like about what I like about what you do, Anne, there are lots of things. <laughs> Let me count the ways. But, <laughs> but one of the things I really like is that you don't get an idea and then leave it alone, right? You'll say, well, I have gloves. Well, there has to be a reason for that. And then all of a sudden, the gloves are incredibly pervasive through the whole thing and have significance everywhere, right? And, and that is how things work. <laughs> right. That's how things work in the real world. Very often, somebody will go, oh, gloves. Okay, that's cool. But if you don't do anything with it, if it doesn't, if it doesn't hook into anything else, then why are they still wearing gloves, right? And where did they come from? And it doesn't feel real. It feels like somebody with a funny hat on to me. Uh, and once again, you know, there are simple, silly adventures that I really love reading uh, that don't worry about why anybody wears gloves or why they wear their big hat. So I'm not saying those are wrong because they're not because I love those things. Uh, but for myself, I want it to feel dimensional and real. And that means a lot of extra thinking about how things fit together. Yeah. I want to fansplain the gloves. Oh, really? Do you have a <laughs> fansplanation for the gloves? <laughs> when I first read the gloves thing, I had this moment of going, oh, oh, this is like my objection to everybody always has to wear shoes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I come That's from a culture bad. where there's, I come from a culture where there's a, a place where shoes belong and a place where shoes do not belong. Yeah. And maybe there's slippers. And so I, I, I was dating somebody who was like, no, no, no. You have to have your feet covered all the toes are yucky. What are you doing? I hate watching people wearing slippers where I can see their toes. And I'm just looking at them going, you are very strange. Or I read this book and it's talking about gloves. And I just went, Oh, <laughs> shoes, gloves, people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is very interesting. <laughs> it, okay. it is interesting. So often people think about those things as being just natural. It's just yucky to see people's toes, at least for some folks. That's, uh, right. I know in my family, uh, well, in my house, we mostly don't wear shoes in the house uh, just because we don't. Uh, but I grew up where you were supposed to always be wearing shoes because feet are dirty right? But I'm like, but they're always in the shoes. How can they be dirty, right? And so, uh, and we don't, in my house, I'm a grown up now, I get to make the rules. We don't wear shoes in the house. Uh, but that's a thing that, you know, what parts of your body you have to cover up, we think of as perfectly natural and to do with, with modesty or not being dirty or whatever. But in fact, it's strongly cultural. It really has to do with other things than that. Hands are about the dirtiest thing on us. Hands are yeah. full of germs. They're awful. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> They get into everything. They do. <laughs> Number one contagion vector. Uh-huh. Yeah. Gloves we were just talking awesome, about clearly. that the other day, weren't we, Kat? <laughs> we were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very fun. Very fun. Shoes, gloves. See, it's all a thing. It is uh -huh. all a thing. Let us put up a mirror to your world. It was amazing. <laughs> Okay, so I was actually going to go back and, um, okay, so, so yeah, <laughs> I have actually covered a lot of the things that I wanted to cover, so that's good. Um, oh, gosh, well, languages. Uh. I'm, I'm thinking about the non-RODC languages. I mean, yes. so... One of the things that happens that's very, very interesting is what I call the translation problem, um, which is 
your base language is going to be English because people have to read the book. Right. Right. But English is going to have to represent whatever this core language is that you're using. And it may also have to represent other languages that you're going to be using. <laughs> and we talked about how you chose the she pronouns for the Rock language. And so one of the things that I think is the most delightful about Breck and about the books in general is that people speak different languages and Breck struggles with her second languages, even though she speaks them like, even though she speaks them ostensibly, like knows them perfectly, she doesn't make good, good judgments on certain kinds of grammatical things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was, that was fairly deliberate. Uh, partly for expositional reasons, because there were certain things I had to get across to the reader in order to teach them what it was I was doing with the, with the pronouns in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but also because uh, that's a thing that happens, mm -hmm. uh, even when you're fluent in a language. And actually, although I didn't know, uh, I didn't have personal experience with uh, speaking languages that are very different about gendered pronouns, I do know that it can be very difficult as an English speaker learning Spanish or French, uh, remembering what gender a noun is. That's yeah. super difficult, even when you know the word. Uh, and uh, at one point I was speaking to, this was after I'd written the book, I was speaking to uh, a native Hungarian speaker whose uh, air English is fabulous uh, and fluent. And uh, I, I had bought a story from him that was uh, for Giganotosaurus, my little web scene, <clears throat> yeah. excuse me. And I was editing it and there was a scene where uh, one character, it was in third person said, uh, he scratched her nose. And I thought, that's odd. And so in my edit notes, I said, D does this character know her well enough? <laughs> and this seems, this seems, it doesn't seem right. And so the writer uh, wrote me back and said, oh, that's kind of embarrassing because my native language is Hungarian, which has no gendered pronouns for people. We only use the one pronoun. And every now and then I'll slip up and use the wrong pronoun. And I discovered later, just sort of listening to conversations, that that's actually quite common with folks who are very fluent in English. Mm -hmm. You would never say there was anything wrong with their, with their English at all. Uh, and, but that automatic assignment of, of a binary gender to a person for linguistic purposes is just not part of the mental furniture as much as it is with someone who's grown up having it. Because honestly, you get it pounded into your head from day one, right? Yeah. Uh, as, as, a, as an English speaker, as, oh, you, as I see you holding up a note, is that Japanese or Chinese? I only saw the end of the- Chinese, sorry. Chinese. Okay. I had gathered, is it now, if, if I remember correctly, Chinese has is is it, there's a difference between written and spoken as to whether there's gendered pronouns for people? Am there I not is, remembering? Yes, the in Mandarin, which is the only form of Chinese that I have any familiarity with, uh, my Cantonese is down to ten words. Um, in Mandarin, there is the personal pronoun ta, but ta is written now. It is written with a. Um, a radical on the left side that either indicates male, female, or neutral. And that was not the case historically. And so even now, though, um, fluent speakers of English who come from Mandarin don't have necessarily a conceptual space carved out for the, um, the gender of the, the speaker. And I have a similar story that I tell in Japanese, which is not about gender, but about... Um, birth order oh you know, my yeah mother asked me why are all of your friends why are all of your friends younger siblings and I said what do you mean and she said they all have older brothers or older sisters and I thought oh because in English we don't have that word and we don't discuss birth order right and so I had mentally just sort of grabbed the unmarked state which was older and used it um, wherever I didn't know. And in fact, I was referring to people's younger brothers and sisters using the wrong term in Japanese because I internalized the, or at least socially was only using the, um, the non-Japanese version. 
Yeah, and that that's a really interesting case of where socially in the United States, that's just not a category, right? We don't I, pay attention to that. I had a friend scold me for asking. She said, why does it even matter? Right, right. And Are you one of those people who has like birth order philosophies and about, about oldest is like this and youngest is like that? And I said, well, I mean, there is some kind of statistical possibility that, that individuals are all different. But I said, no, I was just trying to be grammatically accurate in Japanese. Right. And then and they apologized to me. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's completely mystifying at first, because why would yeah. you even need to put that on a term for somebody? But it makes sense in that other context. Uh, and it can be really difficult to, to conceptualize. Uh, that I was trying to get the kind of actual complexity for translating between cultures and languages, uh, even though uh, at the time I didn't know about the case uh, with Japanese. And there's a, other Asian languages, I believe, have similar. Uh, yes. This Vietnamese, I believe, has, uh, and there's a, uh, a so number of others. Yeah, and um, uh, Cantonese, you can, and, and various languages where you specify which side a person is related to you on their relative age. Yeah. Um, whether I mean, they are married in or and but even like um is it danish with far more and more more and far far and yes danish and far? danish and swedish they you do specify whether it's your father's siblings or your mother's siblings you don't just say aunt and uncle you'll say yeah worldwide and, and your grandparents there's are a clearly huge, enormous listed. variety of kinship terms and yeah. they recognize all kinds of different kinds of of you know uh, categorization strategies. <laughs> right. And translating those becomes problematic because oh. if, if I'm translating something into Japanese, for instance, and I'm talking about a set of, a set of folks, I don't know where they come in sibling order uh, because right. I, as the writer, didn't put that in, but the translator is going to have to do something. Yeah. Right. Uh, and there's, so there's all kinds of ways that uh, I think a lot of folks who don't, uh, who don't have a lot of experience with translating or different languages think of translation as just you put the right word in where the other word is and it's not hard, yeah. but it's actually super difficult. And uh, I know the translators of my trilogy have had a lot of really, depending on the language that they were coming from, had some really interesting problems that they had to solve uh, because either I didn't put in the information that they needed linguistically or because the thing that I was doing was just not doable in the language or, you know, just uh, and have come up with some really interesting solutions to the problems. It's always really cool to talk to the translators. Oh, I bet. I bet. That that moment in the first book where Breck is being really, really annoyed at the grammatical issues of the language that isn't Raj. Um, I think it was, I don't remember if it was, oh, I have to figure out what pronouns are and I can't, I can't gender people properly in this language. It's all very confusing. <laughs> I think that's what it was, but I just had this moment of going, aha, aha, you see? <laughs> I did a lot of I did a lot of putting the book down to do little dances as I was reading. <laughs> oh, that's the best thing in the world for a writer to hear. <laughs> Doing little dances, absolutely. I really did. I literally put it down. And I did this. Yes, yes, because it was probably I was probably reading it during yet another one of these social justice brangles. And why do you want this stuff in there? And it's going to make it a crappy book. And and so yeah, when it won the awards that year, I was like. I, I was completely impossible to be around unless you were <laughs> on the same mind with me because I was just, you know, wanting to do the football end zone dances. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, it looks like we've hit five o'clock um, and it's time for space coffee. Just kidding. <laughs> it's never time for space coffee. Tea, tea, tea. Space. It's time for tea, always. Um, there's so much we could talk about, but um, but but Anne, thank you so much for coming and 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 discussing with us and and Kat, thanks for jumping in with stuff because that yeah. really contributed a lot to our discussion. So um, I appreciate everybody who was here, even the folks who didn't say anything. So just so you know, um, Jonathan and Alyssa and um, Roxy, I appreciate you being here. Thank you for stopping by the show. You're always welcome to come back if you're interested in our topics. Um, and I also have other uh, authors who come on the show. So um, hopefully we can see you again sometime. And um, yes, I do not think that I have, I do not have a plan for next week. <laughs> well, 
that's um, typical me these days. Um, however, socks in space. I think I think I might want to do dishes. <laughs> Dishes, dishes are always good. Dishes are always good. Okay, so next week we're going to talk about dishes. There you go. And you can come back and talk dishes with us. <laughs> if, if I've turned in the novel that I'm supposed to turn in. Oh, well. And so, um, so, so, Anne, sometime I would love to have you back and maybe talk about Providence because I have... I have all of the questions about that book as well, but but we decided to focus on uh, the Imperial Raj books today, which I think was a fine idea because there's certainly plenty to talk about. Um, but I hope you'll uh, I hope you'll decide to come back sometime. I hope so too. I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the broadcast. So thank you all for being here. And once I hit this button, um, we'll wait for the, us to go off the air, and then everybody can kind of take a little deep breath. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much.